Right, so hello again. So we shall continue. Let's make some textures. So as discussed earlier, we're going to make what we're we going to make. What we're we going to make. Oh yes, rebar texture. So we're going to make a we're going to make some textures. We don't have to worry too much about the diffuse, which is the colour. What we're going to make is our grid. And then we're going to make a rebar texture that's going to have those striations or patterns on them. And then we're going to convert those into normal maps. So we're doing the 2D image-based conversion process to create our normal maps. So for this, depending on the tool that you have available to you, I don't know if Affinity, I don't think Affinity has a normal map converter. No, it doesn't. So if you're using Photoshop or do I have GIMP installed on here? No, I don't. So do I have the normal map program installed on here? Endo. Is it Endo? Endjob. No, I don't have Endjob. So let's just grab that as it's a, a pretty quick download. I'm going to extract because it's a zip file. I'm doing this off screen because, well, that's where everything is. Right, so that was relatively quick. So this is endjob, and all it does is basically convert what we will be producing, which is a grayscale image. It converts it into a normal map. So you can either use endjob. How big is GIMP? Let's see if we can install that. So the reason for doing this is that you will need a 2D image editing software package application that can convert grayscale images into normal maps. So Affinity Photo Editor doesn't have a normal map converter, I don't think. So you have to use something like Enjob, which is a third party app and or GIMP which has a normal map filter or I think Photoshop the newer versions of Photoshop have a normal map filter built in so let's just quickly install GIMP
Now that a next. Probably she should have done this before starting the stream. But we need these programs to create our normal maps or convert the images that we'll be producing into normal maps. Hi, Jesse. Oof, it takes a while to install GIMP. I forgot about that. And it's installed. Now, where is it? There it is. So that's uh, gimp.org, G-I-M-G-I-M-P.org. And NJOB, if you just search for NJOB or GIMP, you'll get the associated links for those that you can download it from. That's if you don't have Photoshop or something else that can produce normal maps. So what we're going to use are these two programs to create our normal maps because what we'll do, uh, now which one is it? Generic. Yeah, so it's for GIMP is filters, generic, normal map. That's what we'll be using. And for end job, all we do is just drop the image into the editor and it will create it. Oh, thank you, uh, Jesse. Well, we try our best to keep, uh, you know, make it as helpful as possible for non-English speakers to translate all the tutorials and the videos. So that's good news. Right, so what we're going to do is create our rebar texture first. So all we're going to do is use the image that we exported previously or earlier. And there are different ways of doing this depending on you know your uh, preferences or how you prefer to uh, work. So let's just fill that and then change the color. To a rough mid gray color. Because the way that the normal maps work
it converts well the way that the conversion process works is that it converts grayscale values into normal normalized colors which are those funny purple colors that you see when you look at normal maps and it does this based on height essentially it's more there's more to it technically but for the sake of argument so what it does is it converts so if you have a series of colors black through to white white is considered the highest point the highest height you can go to and black or dark colors are the darkest or lowest points you can go to so anything that you do in between those creates different values in terms of height and depth. So all we're going to do for our rebar is get our paintbrush, or we could use the pen, or we could use the shape tool. It doesn't really matter. Because all we're going to do, let's try the pen tool. Whoops. Node editor. Let's do that again. I hate nodes. We just did a straight line. Yes, that's all we need to do. Uh, right, so stroke. So now this is where it gets tricky because obviously we are limited to 512. Well, actually, now that we've got, now that iView Studio is released publicly, we can now use 512 by 512 textures, but because we're using relatively low resolution images, when we're trying to do details as we're doing or about to do, one pixel. We don't have much room to play with in terms of How much? All right, so copy, paste. Ninety. So this is the pattern, and we have to do that all the way down our 512. So grab those four, copy. Like I say, there are an infinite number of ways of doing this, depending on your preference and how familiar you are with the application you are using. This does is it's just creating that. 
pattern that you see on rebar. But the reason for doing it this way, copy, paste, Right, so we want this to tile. So we have to be aware of what's going on at the bottom here versus what's going on at the top. And that copy, paste. So we want that. Let's just drop this down. Right, so that is our rebar texture. Simple as that. So that's its actual size. So in terms of a gaff. So in terms of what this means for our normal map, so as I say, the conversion process works using grayscale. So what it's going to do is convert the colors that we see into normalized tonal values, so all those purples and blues. So it'll create these sections will be higher than these sections, which will be higher than these sections. Because white is height and uh, black is depth. So what we should end up with is this sort of profile all the way down our texture. Now when you're making these, you want to try and make your maps, uh, not your maps, uh, you want to try and keep everything layered or a separate objects or however you do it so that you can make adjustments. Because everything should be grayscale. So what you want to do is keep all the values relative to each other in terms of the depth that you want to create. So if this background, let's go to 200. If this background is brighter, the difference in depth around each of these Uh, what would they be? Um, what's the opposite of indentation? These raised sections will be smaller than if the background was darker. because the tonal difference between the two is more extreme, which results in the normal map conversion process being more extreme in its conversion. It's not necessarily always visible. It might not be visible on something like this because we are using such a small texture. So at actual size, let's go to actual size. So there's not a lot of pixel data for the conversion process to work with. Oh, hello again, Ahmed. But let's just save this. So we'll do two versions of this so we can see. Save as. 
Uh, bar normal one. So I have to export this. Export PNG or TGA or depending on what you have available try and make it a lossless format because compression plays havoc with normal maps so I'm just going to use a TGA image no compression that's all right export All right, and then do another one with brighter. But like I say, this might not be as evident because we're using such a small image. Export right so with our normal map programs we want to drop our images in so where are they? Right, right, so there they are. So that's the first one. Can't zoom in on this program, unfortunately, so we can't get any closer to it. But creating our normal map using NJob, filter, height map to normal map, and it just converts it. We get these values that we can set up where we can change how harsh or how strong the effect is. Okay, so we can copy that, copy. New from clipboard. So that's what we've got from rebar one. So let's bring rebar one in. Where's that gone? Let's zoom in on that one. So that's the one with the darker background. So we can see what it's doing. Let's convert the other one. Filter, height map, normal map. Similar values. Copy. So we can see the difference between the two is quite dramatic. So that's number two. So we can see that if we use darker colours 
Oh, well, if we have greater contrast between our tonal values, we get much stronger normal maps. Whereas if we use a softer contrast between the two, in this particular instance, we've just got two tones. Well, I think there's probably maybe three or four different values of gray to white. But that contrast affects how strong the normal map is. So you want to keep that in mind when you are making your normal maps just because this is converting essentially a grayscale image into a normal map it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to be making your normal maps with such high contrast as we've got in this particular version where this might be more appropriate because it gives us a softer or less aggressive conversion. So what we can do with these is save these, save, uh, yes, so let's just save as. And that one is number two. That one is number one. And then we'll export these as PNG. So when you are generating your normal map, you want to use a lossless format. So depending on your application, you might have access to TGA, TIFF, or bitmap, BMP. Uh, if not, use PNG, but make sure there's no compression associated with the PNG. So that's when you are making your normal map. So when you are converting your grayscale into, so you're saving your image for conversion as a grayscale image. When you're saving them for IMVU, make sure they are PNGs. Don't use JPEG for normal maps. Uh, so that's okay. Export. That's all right. And let's save that one. Export. Export. Save. So we just want to create just a grayscale diffuse. So this will make it easy to see. Uh, 16, was it 16 pixels by 256? No, 512. Create. Just make it grayscale. This makes the normal map easier to see. And now we've lost it. It's about 140. By the way, you may not know this, but this is the reason why the background of your photo editing app is mid-toned grey or darker grey because it, it helps you assess tonal values. Save as. Use, save, and just export. Right, so we've got two normal maps, two versions, and we've got our diffuse. So we can open these onto our rebar. So we want the rebar texture itself first. Well, the the texture for the main rebar. So we're going to change that. So again, 
going to click on the icon, get the pop-up, add image, find our replacement, which is not those. They're PNGs. Rebar diffuse. So we'll just apply that so we can see it. So that's our diffuse. And then we're going to assign the normal map. So that one, add image, scroll down, open, preview. And what we see is that So we've now got this pattern in place now. So that's our rebar texture. So let's load in the other one. That's the aggressive one. Let's load in the other one. See, that one's much more subtle. It is there, but it's very subtle. So that's another aspect of making normal maps. Although we've got a much more aggressive tonal conversion because we've used the image with a higher contrast versus image with a lower contrast, depending on what the normal map is being used for, the lower contrast image is no good for what we've got here because it's much more difficult to see the pattern or the effect. So what we actually really want is the aggressive one, which we can see the effect much more clearly that way. So that's a tip. That's something to keep in mind when you are making your normal maps. So you don't necessarily have to you don't necessarily have to be too aggressive with your normal maps, but under certain circumstances having an aggressive normal map is more advantageous because the effect itself, the effect of the normal map the the, the normal map actually produces is easier to see or understand visually on the mesh. So that's our simple rebar. So what we're going to do now is the grid texture. And we're going to use, well, we're going to use this image. So we've got our UV maps that we exported from earlier. So the front face occupies the entire width, the front and back. The sides and the top are slightly uh, narrower, less width. So what we need to do is make sure that we set up our rebar grid in such a way that we don't end up with a pole, one of these things, on this line. So we want to try and drop a pole in there, like so. And that's all that this, that's all that exporting this UV map helps us with, is positioning our verticals so that we don't end up chopping or cropping or clipping into uh, the image and causing a, a partial, well, it's, it's a clipped image. So let's do for this, let's do the same sort of thing. So where's the pen tool? 
draw a line. That is straight. Thickness one pixel. It's too thin. That's all right, three pixels. So what we're going to do now is copy, paste, and again, there are different ways of doing this depending on what your preferences are. But all we're doing is creating a grid doesn't necessarily have to be precise. Although, having said that, let's make some adjustments. So again, because this is a tiling texture, so the gap that's created here, two of those needs to be roughly the same as that gap between each of these so that it tiles reasonably well when the texture is repeated, if it's repeated. So let's just make some adjustments. That'll do. Copy, paste, rotate, horizontal. Same for the top and bottom again. So copy, paste. Just eyeballing all of this. Uh, so we only really need to two. So get rid of that one. Right, so that is Let's just save that, save as. Rebar cage. Right, so. Can I make these? Oh no. Oh, it's this one. Can we do multiples? I don't use this application that much. No, can I do one at a time? So we're doing the same thing as we did for the rebar, but with this one, but with the cage texture, we've got a slightly different consideration to keep in mind.
this is a little bit laborious, but I don't want to join these all together because it's best to keep everything separate so that you can make adjustments if you need to. But what we can do Dark, oops. That's better. So this is the laborious part where we have to adjust each of these because we forgot to change the color to start with. But again, normal map conversion. So these are white because these are going to be the height of our cage mesh. But what we're also going to do is use this as the basis for, for our opacity map, which we were looking at earlier. So that's our grid. Oh, I've got those two. Right, so that's our grid. Save. So we're going to do the same thing again. Just going to do an initial conversion, see what that looks like. So file, export, TGA, lossless again because we're converting this into our normal map. Export. I'm just going to call this template so I know what it is. But this time we're going to drop it into GIMP, see what that does. So that's our image. Now to convert this into a normal map in GIMP, we go into Filters, Generic, Normal Map. Whoops, Filters, Generic, Normal Map. And it'll bring this little pop-up up and it'll convert the image in the background. So we've got similar settings to what we had in NJob Scale doesn't need to be this high. That's OK. That's all right. So uh, that, and that is literally it. So once you've got your clean normal, uh, no, clean normal, but once you've got your clean gray scale image, just convert it. This is as simple as the conversion process is. This is all we do when we convert our grayscale images into a normal map. Is this. Okay. And we can save that. Oh, I don't like doing that in here. So let's see if we can copy. Save as. If 
Fire and our rebar. Normal. So, we've got our normal map. Just going to create a grayscale for our diffuse. Yeah, so this is 256 by 512. Grayscale the background. Ah, we can't see it now, so let's make that a little bit brighter. There we go. Rebar diffuse. Export. Uh, so this is the diffuse, so again we can use JPEG for this or PNG, it doesn't really matter. Right, so that's our diffuse. Got our normal map, but we also now need... Uh, where is it? We now need our opacity map. So as we've got our rebar cage template what we need to do is just make the background black save as this is our opacity export Now, whether you use JPEG or PNG for this is up for debate. If it's a complex opacity map, so a feathered texture or a texture with various gradients of transparency in your opacity map, you might want to use JPEG, but with a low compression. But for something like this, we can go with PNG because it's a very simple... Well, it's probably got less than six tonal values in it so that's good for PNG so export right so we've got our opacity map got our normal and then we've got our diffuse so in studio we still got the diffuse image that we were playing around with earlier today so we select our grid Get rid of that. Replace this image. So click on the icon. Place that with our diffuse. There it is. Add in the normal map just so that we can see it. Did we save that? I don't think we saved that. No, we didn't save that. So export. Again, normal map, so PNG. So that's now available. So let's just preview this so we can see the effect. So we can see what the normal map has done. And we can also now see why we did what we did with the UV map. So we've avoided clipping the image on the edges. So this is why it's a good idea to pay attention to what your uh, not no, normal map, what the UV map is doing with respect to your image. So that's the a normal map for the cage and it's creating that sort of three-dimensional aspect and it looks like looking at this 
Where is the light source in the scene? So is it me, or does that look as if it's upside down? There are multiple li lights. So where are the lights? All right, so there's one there. There's one there. Are there two or three? What we could do is being able to increase the size of those markers so that we can see them more easily. But anyway, so that's our normal map for our rebar grid. So what we're going to do now is add the opacity map. And that is our cage. But what we want to do, switch to alpha test. Because this is a simple image, we don't want to use composite. So we're increasing the value to see how much of the image that we can clip out without it causing any problems. God, that looks like we can go all the way up to the top. Whoops, that's reflectivity, not threshold. That's the one we wanted. Oh, there we go. So we can kind of make the wire thinner without necessarily having to do anything to the image itself in our image editor. But let's just double check. So we won't cast shadows, receive shadows. I don't think this does anything right now, but rebar. So that's our cage with our normal maps in place. But it's not as clear as it is in this scene because, um, let's see. Let's try that one. Uh, you're very welcome, Nate. Oh. Now that is why we use normal maps. So that is pretty awesome. But now I'd need to confirm this. But so what we were talking about earlier today was. Uh oh, I've got. Oh no, it crashed. So what we were talking about earlier today is that when we do something like this, where we have to see both the inside and the outside of 
the mesh with normal maps, if we're using normal maps, we're going to do shininess map as well, by the way. But when we're using normal maps, we have to be aware of what normal maps are doing in response to scene lighting. Because the, the normal map effect itself, the way that the effect works is that it, it works by responding to whatever lighting is in the scene. Now, if we do double sided, if we enable that, what that effectively does, again, I need to double check this, uh, what that does is it duplicates and flips the outside surfaces inside. But when it does that, it's duplicating the way that light behaves with respect to our normal maps on this side of the mesh to this side of the mesh. So it makes the normal map, well, it inverts the texture and it may very well also invert, uh, well, it doesn't, it inverts it when it shouldn't be. So it's, it is literally mirroring what we see on this side, on the outside, to the inside of the mesh. And with normal maps, what that means is that, uh, so let's say we have our lighting, our normal map behaving. So that's our surface. Light source is coming from this direction, so our normal maps behave as if lighting is hitting surfaces from this side. But if the normal map is, well, if the faces are flipped, it means we get the normal map flipping, but it also flips the way that the light is interacting with our object, which is backwards. So on the outside of the mesh, the lighting and the normal maps behaves the way that it should, but on the inside, it inverts it. So what we actually want is for this side of the mesh to behave properly with respect to the light source. So if our light source is as up here, we want these normal maps to behave as though they are being illuminated from that same light source. So if you don't duplicate the mesh, IMVU may be flipping the lighting literally and not adjusting for our being on the inside of the mesh. So what we have to do, well, not just in Blender, but we're creating a second surface and manually flipping the faces so they point inwards. And that compensates for, because the normal maps are then mapped correctly with respect to the lighting, the direction of the light. So our normal maps on the inside of our mesh don't look as if they're back to front or inside out. So that's something you have to be aware of when you are working with your normal maps. That looks quite cool, actually. It's a bit it's a bit complicated, but when you actually do it, so when you test this, you'll see what happens. So we have to be aware of what double sided does to our normal maps and our meshes. So if you're doing something that is double sided like this, you don't always want to be enabling two-sided or double-sided to get the inside and the outside of the mesh showing properly. That looks pretty cool. So 
let's just do a shininess. Just do a quick shininess map. So what we can do with this, I think, is let's make it dark. And again, grayscale values. Shininess. Let's do this as shininess one. Whoops. And let's do a brighter one. export that and again this doesn't necessarily need to be PNG because there's nothing particularly sensitive about shining and smap so we can use a JPEG if we want to but we'll just continue using PNG because that's what we've been using export open recent so that's the dark one export So all we're going to do, grid, load in our shininess, open, add image. So all we've got for this is just a flat texture. There's nothing complicated about it because we don't need, we don't need to create a grid or anything like that because that's created or done by the opacity map. Our opacity map provides all of this information that IVU needs. So we can literally just use a 256 by 256 and it won't matter. Or a flat color. Right, so let's do the dark one first. Preview. So that doesn't look as if it's done much because we want to enable reflectivity. So let's put that to point, well, 50. See what that does. And keep in mind that reflectivity responds relative to our light sources. Have they toned it down? I think they might have toned it down. Let's go all the way up there. So there we go. It's can't really see it too well on this, but there's a reason for that, and that's because we've used a darker colour. So if we keep the same setting that we've got here now at 94. And we just change the image. We should see a difference. See how much more shiny that becomes. So the effect can be affected by the color or the tonal value, grayscale value of your shininess map. So you can yonk the reflectivity all the way up to 100. And it'll do its thing. So it is shiny, it is reflective, and it's more reflective because we've, uh, we've used a brighter shininess map. If we use a darker shininess map, the effect is much more subtle. but it is shiny. So when you're working with your shininess maps, that's one of the things that you can watch out for. You don't necessarily need to control how shiny something is by using the reflectivity value. 
because essentially what that's doing is it it essentially defines so the color defines where the shininess is well the tone the tonal value decides uh, defines where the shininess is and how shiny that shininess is but reflectivity defines how bright or hard that shininess is so if we let's do one that's white so if we max everything out so this is number three we'll max it all out Add that in. And we can see that what's happened is that we've got very bright, hard edges on our shininess. So what reflectivity is doing is making the reflectivity itself, this, the shiny highlights, it's making them harder and more defined. So if we keep those values again and we load in the darker one, we can see that it is shiny, but it's much more subtle. So there are two ways that we can control how shiny something looks and what you really want to be doing is using your images rather than reflectivity because all reflectivity is essentially doing is making the highlights harder if the tonal values are brighter so closer to white and we're going to get very hard highlights if we use reflectivity or if we set that high like so. So you'd be using this for highly polished metal versus a darker color for something that's, well, not polished, used, worn out. Let's do one for our rebar. Uh, new so that's 16 by 256, uh, oh, 256, 512. Create. That's white, so it's too bright. That's a bit too bright. Save as. Export. So our rebar texture or material. We don't need an opacity for this. Shininess. Add. Rebar shininess, just do the one. And again, it hasn't done anything because we need to increase the reflectivity value. Let's bump it up halfway. And there we can see it's enabled our shininess. So let's just yonk it all the way up to 100. And there we can see how our normal map is behaving in conjunction with our shininess. Uh, 
there, so let's do that one. So they're more or less the same. Yes, yes, thanks for reminding me, Roy. Yeah, so to also as well as so as well as the colour or the tone and the reflectivity value, how reflective everything looks at the end of the day also depends on the light source in the scene. So if we turn on our lights, so where's the spots? Yeah, we could really do with being able to see larger points of light for these. But I'm going to assume it's over here somewhere. But how bright the scene is will also affect how bright the reflectivity is or how how bright the um, the shininess effect is. So even though we've got these yonked all the way up to the top, we're maxing them out. In a different room, this might appear even brighter because it might have stronger lighting or more lighting in the scene. So that, that's another one. And unfortunately for creators or meshes, that's one thing that we can't control, obviously. So your best bet when you are making your products yes yeah, so uh, Roy's just mentioning f um, so scene lighting and accessory lights so those are the things people can add to the scene that affect the way that your products look so when you are creating your normal map and shininess map what you want to really try and be doing is aiming towards a middle uh, uh, middling with how shiny something looks and the default room will give us a little hint of that but obviously it's a bit difficult to see how the effect is working depending on what the object is but we can see that this is it looks like sil and silver now yeah so this is what uh, this is what Roy is just talking about. So we've changed the scene and our materials have completely changed their appearance. So we haven't changed any of the settings. Kept those the same. Let's just change the room. Uh, what was that one? So it looks reasonable here because the room is dark and there is very little the, the lighting's much more subtle but in the other room it over brightens and blows it out so when you are making your it doesn't affect the normal maps so much as it will do with the, the the shininess when you are making your shininess maps try and aim towards a middling range in terms of the tones that you use and how severe or strong the effect is because you don't want to be in a situation where in a room like this somebody comes in with a light accessory and just completely blows out your product because their product is conflicting with yours so to speak so go for grayscale, mid-tones for your shininess. It may not necessarily look as good as you might want it to appear, but it, it gives you much more room. Uh, you've got more latitude up or down depending on the scene lighting or the amount of lighting that's in the scene itself. But that is our normal maps and shininess maps, and we don't necessarily have to do anything particularly complicated. But from a meshing point of view, the thing to remember is that if we are going to be looking through our mesh and seeing both sides, we want to keep in mind this 
trick, if you want to call it that, of manually duplicating the inside and outside so they are two separate faces. So the, the normal maps, particularly, work the way that they should do. It also does affect the shininess maps. We can't really see it in here. But the shininess effect does the same thing. If IMVU is doing the two-sided thing and just duplicating and flipping, it's also duplicating and flipping the scene lighting on the inside of the mesh, which is why meshes sometimes look like they're lit from the inside when they shouldn't be. Oh, thanks, Roy. It was It's just something I threw together quickly over several days. Um, but that's one of the things you want to watch out for if you're going to use normal maps and shininess. I'm intrigued to see what this does, the emission. I don't know if that's available in the public release or not, because I'm special and have access to this special version of the studio. Oh, it'll be in store, don't worry. I, I, it, it, I'm going to upload it. This is a Halloween thing. Uh, it's just an accessory. So it moves with the avatar. But I'll make the... Um, normal maps and um yes it's uh yeah yeah silent hill uh what was i going to say yes i'll i'll this will be published in the catalog and it, it it'll be available for derivation uh did I say, oh, thanks, Nate, on YouTube, and Jesse, and Ahmed on YouTube. Well, we try our best. Uh, yes, so, what did we, uh, one of the things, rebar grid. So, yes, remember as well that we can use the threshold to affect our texture so we can make we can make our mesh thinner just by altering the threshold of the alpha test so we don't need to go back into our image editor, where is it? Yeah, so we don't need to go back into our image editor and adjust our opacity map. So all we need to do is just make that as we would normally make it. And then in IMVU in Studio, we can use the threshold to make the rebar thicker or thinner. And that makes it look like it's um, steel strips versus wire. So that's another tip or trick. So yes, that's our normal maps and shininess maps and how they all fit together with our UV maps in Blender and what we're doing there. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Leave our cage. There we are. So that's the front. That's the front. That's the side. Oops. That's the side. So we'll have used less space for this in order for. So we've squished it. 
in order for it to proportionally look the same as the front. So you don't want to, or you want to avoid just doing a one-to-one -one mapping so that when we're looking at the when we're looking at the grids of the texture, they're all more or less the same size and they're aligned on all sides. And it just makes it easier to texture our objects. So there's a few tips there in terms of making our meshes with a mind to using tiled images uh, where's that one gone rebar 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 there it is rebar so that's our tiled image it doesn't matter that our uv map extends above because of the way that we made it it cleanly tiles top to bottom without any issues Uh, hi, Queen. You've just caught us on the end of the stream, but this will be a available to watch after the fact. But we were just talking about, uh, well, these two I did one earlier this morning and this one. We're just talking about optimizations basically for meshing and normal maps and shininess maps in IMVU Studio. Yeah, so, per what Roy was saying, scene lighting, so this looks like it's blown out because it's using the same light sources. Where are they? We really could do with having much larger objects that we can see much more clearly. Oh, there they are, there's one. And there's the other one. So relative to our right, so relative to our object, we've got our light sources like so. But they're the same intensity. So they're exactly the same position in this darker version as they are in the lighter version. But this looks much brighter because the background is white or off-white. So that's going to be the biggest challenge really for creators and meshes is moderating their shininess maps to accommodate and that's not to mention either uh, oh no we can't do it in this room that's not to mention either rooms that have high high um, what's the word ambient lights ambient lighting or ambient illumination which kind of kills normal maps and shininess maps. So as a creator, you're going to have to keep an eye on that with your products. So any bad reviews that you get about how bad your products look in light in certain rooms, it's more likely going to be an issue with the room itself and the lighting of the room rather than your product. So, you know, as we were saying earlier, 
try and develop your products so that they're middle of the road and that'll give you more latitude up or down to compensate well it'll it'll allow more latitude for the product in a room based on the lighting right so yes we'll call it quits there that's uh, two videos on normal maps and um, shenanigans and uh, there is another video I'll be doing another stream for a different product in fact let's minimize that now, did I do anything to this no I didn't do anything to that so we're doing a stream this is just a preview and save because this has come up a couple of times if I can remember where it put it too many products too many projects I cannot remember where I put it, but basically it's, yeah, I can't remember where I put it, but I'll be doing a stream animating a simple pet using studio. Oh, there it is. Uh, no, that's pumpkin bike. Honestly, I have no idea where I put things. Oh, there it is. So we'll be doing a doing a, uh, another stream animating this so we're going to animate that as a simple sort of not sure if it's <laughs> not sure if this is uh, we'll do this as a pet or a furniture item but what we'll do is set this up because this has come up a few times is it, it it can be done as an animated furniture item or an animated accessory, which is essentially what a pet is when we do them like this. So if we make these kinds of projects, we can convert the, uh, we can turn these into pets or furniture items or essentially accessories. Um, you know, and as accessories, they follow the user around the room, whereas furniture item, they don't. But the two although the animation aspect of it is the same the way that they are rigged for animation differs depending on whether it's a furniture item or whether it's an accessory and that's tripping people up a little bit because there there are differences in the way that we can set furniture items up versus accessories so i'll try and do a stream at some point with this this project and setting this up as a furniture item or an accessory, an animated, simple animated project. Uh, yes, yeah, Roy, that's that's right. Um, Roy's just saying, did a shiny outfit meant to uh, meant to be a silvery plastic in one room when someone was wearing a face light? It was overblown white. Yes, that's what we have to watch out for as meshes creators. We have to be careful how 
our normal maps and shininess maps affect products in IMVU. So although although you may want something to be as blown out as this in terms of how bright this looks, so it looks like you know a cage made from silver. Um, you may not want to have the reflectivity values set up so high or using a shininess map that's um, such a light color. You might want to tone it down a little bit just so that you have, well, so that you allow room creators or, you know, users the ability to add things to their room or remove things or wear accessory lights and change the look of the project at uh, the product so just do be aware of that let's just go back to that spotlight room this is one of IMVU's um, defaults when they were setting up test so eventually this is what we can look forward to is shadows and that looks awesome right we'll call it quits there and uh, keep an eye out for the next stream and um, thanks for dropping by lurkers thanks for dropping by roy queen Gaff, Tochi, I missed him this morning. Uh, Jesse, Ahmed, Nate. Uh, Pav, Pavlusk, Pavlusk. Well, he, he might be in prison. We don't know. It's a Halloween item. Uh, but anyway, so we'll leave it there. Uh, yes, Jesse. Um, the live stream will... I think what I might do with these now is just leave the live streams available. But there will also be... A, there's a locally recorded... 1080p version which will be uploaded later um, the live streams are 12 720p so they're slightly lower resolution but I'll leave them in place uh, so that you have those and uh, right yes quality quits there and we shall see you on the next stream so thanks for dropping stropping dropping by Stropping. Yeah, it's getting ready with the razor blade for Halloween and Silent Hill. Right. Bye for now, everyone. <laughs>